Thank you very much. Yeah, this is now one particular country and also a little bit of different uh, uh, disciplinary perspective because I'm a social anthropologist by background. Thank you very much again for the invitation. Uh, I have been following electoral developments in Myanmar since 2010 in the framework of my PhD project. My fieldwork there, including a participation in the EU election expert mission 2012 and consultancy for two European INGOs, ARIS and DRI, together with the Carter Center this year, inform my presentation today. Hence, my perspective on electoral integrity, as Professor Norris explained, uh, for the wider study of the subfield is grounded both in academic work and the work of a practitioner. This goes well together with my approach as an anthropologist to participant observation in the pursuit of an anthropology of policy with multi-sided fieldwork. My fieldwork in Myanmar suggests that it is worthwhile considering electoral integrity not only as a lens to analyze the conduct of elections and eventual malpractices, but also as a space for social interaction. In Myanmar, I have perceived electoral integrity as an important lead motive for both civil society activism from below, as well as for international support coming from outside providing a conceptual framework for advancing reforms in an ongoing political transition, which I will first look at in my presentation now. Secondly, I will analyze the coming into existence of the demand for electoral integrity from bottom up and will explain conditions for election observation. Thirdly, I will look into the emerging field of electoral support and will conclude with some future perspectives. A coup d'etat in 1962 in Myanmar or Burma, I do not pursue any political agenda with the use of these terms, started decades of military regime. Public protests in 1988 brought about a change in the military elite, but also a new demand for multi-party elections, which were held in 1990, and of which famously Do Aung San Suu Kyi, then newly founded National League for Democracy, emerged as the winner. As announced briefly prior to the polls, the army decided not to hand over power until a new constitution would be drawn. This process was to last for two decades. Following a relaunch of a national convention to draft this new constitution, a referendum was held to get it passed in May 2008. Reports from inside the country spoke about severe pressure on the voters at that time. And finally, this led to the holding of general elections on 7 November 2010. Without surprise, building on years of increasing boycott and sanctions supported by exile advocacy groups and based on human rights violations inside the country, the international community condemned these elections from the outset, as it did with the new constitution. While it foresaw the establishment of a nominally civilian regime, the 2008 constitution secures the continued influence of the army through 25% of seats in all houses uh, of the legislature. All senior members, including President Ten Sein, who were to establish the new government in March 2011, were formerly generals. All these factors combined did not instill much trust in the process with diplomats nor with the majority of voters. The elections took place in a subdued atmosphere with great limits to the freedom of expression and severe restrictions for political parties to compete. Based on observer reports, the overwhelming success of the military proxy party uh, came about through the fraudulent use of advanced ballots and outright rigging on the side of the National Election Management Body, the uh, Union Election Commission, UEC. To the surprise of many, President Ten Sein started to launch a serious reform process that led inter alia to the participation of Aung San Suu Kyi, who had boycotted the 2010 elections in by-elections on 1st April 2012. These by-elections for 45 seats became necessary as elected MPs had vacated their seats for governmental positions. The UEC, meanwhile newly appointed, seemed to be committed to run a more transparent process than before. Although the legal framework had hardly changed since 2010, the international community embraced these by-elections as a rite de passage to start re-engaging with the country in new ways. They also marked the turning point for domestic politics, with the NLD and allies de facto letting go of the 1990 results, accepting the new constitutional framework and joining parliament. 
Currently, all eyes are already turned to 2015, when the next general elections are scheduled. A parliamentary-driven constitutional review process is expected to start this month. But how did we get here? Let me turn to demands for electoral integrity from below. It had been argued that civil society died in Myanmar, or more accurately, that it was murdered during the military regime. In the mid-2000s, new conceptualizations of civil society and new research started to suggest that civil society was re-emerging on the local er level in areas of state weakness, such as in health and education. Already prior to the referendum of 2008, a few emerging civil society organizations started to launch educational activities. Uh, educational activities with the goal to familiarize a broader population with the contents of the new constitution. The rationale behind this activity was to get familiar with the new framework to actually be able to argue for or against it. Similar activities were continued ahead of the 2010 elections to equip voters with broader knowledge of citizen rights and the, and the technicalities of the ballot. However, education was not the only civil society pro-election activity that took place in an environment that Harito did not know such activism. At least two networks carefully prepared to deploy domestic election observers for the elections of 2010. At that time, these exercises were carried out with great secrecy under the radar screen of the government. In one interview, I was told that it felt like a Cold War cell operation and that the success of the operation entirely depended on the courage and vision of a few individuals. Reflecting on these experiences, election observation under the outgoing uh, authoritarian regime provided a means for a younger generation to get politically engaged without necessarily being partisan. Although the term electoral integrity was not explicitly used by my interview partners, this is exactly what they wanted to contribute to, a more transparent and inclusive process. In 2012, it was not possible for those observers to publish their findings inside the country, but their initial experiences found followers during the unforeseen by-elections of 2012. With some links to the earlier uh, observers, new organizations emerged to monitor the by-elections in selected constituencies, but with less preparation. Attracted by the sudden participation of Aung San Suu Kyi, the observers of 2012 also appeared to be less concerned with impartiality. However, they were now operating more openly and with some unofficial consent of the government. They also published reports and later shared them with the UEC. The legal framework for elections in Myanmar, as promulgated with the electoral laws of 2010, does not foresee election observation during the entire process, but only grants limited witnessing of citizens during the count. Nevertheless, some observers use this limited provision to argue for their right to observe. I have perceived a great interest among these observers to learn more about international standards, which they could refer to when analyzing their domestic process not only when elections are due, but also while reforms are underway, the electoral cycle. With Myanmar not having ratified the ICCPR, there is currently not much legal leverage in even minimal international standards. However, the emerging exchange between national and international actors might bring change to this situation. Election observers in Myanmar evidently follow examples from elsewhere in the region and internationally. It is difficult to reconstruct to which extent these first experiences with national election observation were supported by donors, international organizations or transnational advocacy networks. Undeniably, some foreign support existed, but donors would have hardly disclosed their support at that time due to the sanctions regime. When asked about the roots for their efforts, one of the involved individuals answered that it was not a homegrown idea, but a homegrown commitment. These conditions have changed since 2010. On a domestic level, while observers could hardly talk about their work in 2010, they were more daring in 2012. By now, to borrow from Bourdieu, Domestic election observation experience has become a sort of social and cultural capital that can make a difference when negotiating with donors. 
On the international level, the ease of the sanctions allows more open and much intensified engagement in democracy promotion. The European Union deployed an election assessment mission in mid-2012, and several others were to follow. By now, NDI, IRI, IFES, and International IDEA have all established base or are about to do so in Myanmar, none of which is easy. After years of self-isolation and sanctions, Myanmar governmental stakeholders are not yet familiar with internationals in the form of uh, fact-finding missions or consultants. The UEC opened its doors to foreign experts and relationships are currently being established. International support does not only address civil society organizations in relation to citizen observation, but of course, a range of technical, procedural, administrative, and legal questions often geared to the EMB as major recipient. Topics of possible support and intervention include the training of different levels with the EMB, a review of the voter lists and technical advice about a new register, a review of the electoral laws, including the constitution, and as a subfield of the letter, a review of the electoral system. A debate about electoral system choice to date still quite shallow uh, and polarized between the existing FPTP and proportional options, has evolved soon after the by-elections. Colleagues from IFES and International IDEA have already started to look into these questions. The Carter Center, as we have heard, could stand ready to bring deeper reflections on the use of international standards, starting with the ICCPR, but exploring public international law in more depth. However, the future of electoral integrity in Myanmar does not depend on the specific approaches of international actors alone, nor on the continued commitment of local drivers of change. It is rather a mix of several factors and an outcome of encounters between different actors. On the macro level, President Ten Sein has much to do to keep the reform process on track. Sectarian violence and ongoing peace negotiations are more eminent than elections in 2015. On the micro level, civil society organizations and individuals therein, increasingly overwhelmed with donor attention, have to take careful decisions how to move forward, which form of activism to take, which advocacy to bet on. The ideological difference and gaps of trust between various groups cannot be underestimated and make the eventual deployment of a larger observer group for 2015 questionable. Local governmental actors, such as the UEC, are embedded in their own elite networks that might be drawn to the one or other direction in ongoing tensions between reformists and more conservative military. Their choices for or against technical assistance also depend on their immediate interlocutors and their capacities to communicate. The particular norms transfer that is taking place in international support to the electoral process is not a natural given, but is in itself constantly emerging. A gender setting is determined by negotiations between the different international organizations involved and their different capacities to attract donor support. Last but not least, these negotiations often depend on the individuals involved, who bring different competences and motivations, move between organizations, and pursue their own career tracks by promoting electoral integrity. All these factors combined make the enhancing of electoral integrity a process with uncertain outcome in Myanmar. Donors and practitioners are advised to use a common language when deploying the idea of international electoral standards. Looking back to the recent electoral experiences of 2010 and 2012, it is evident that the government's goodwill rather than, and not changes to the electoral framework helped to make the elections appear more transparent and inclusive. Though I do not suggest that it is very likely that election results will not be transferred into a legitimate new government after the next polls in 2015, Without having minimal international standards in place that create the safeguards for it not to happen, the risk continues to exist. And coming back to demands from below, if the electoral law in Myanmar is altered to allow the deployment of international and national election observers in 2015 on broader scale, this could be one constituting element of electoral integrity. Thank you very much.